What is love? What is love? Some of you, I'm sure, love your car. I know some of you even love pizza. I hope you love your wife. It's on mute. What's love? It's on mute. Am I on? Yes. All I hear myself now, but I assume that the people in the sound booth were taking care of things, but you know what? If anything can happen, it could happen, right? But again, what is love? We talk about love your car, love pizza, love a lot of things. And unfortunately, in the English language, as I've probably mentioned to you before, there's basically one word that we use for love, L-O-V-E. Oh, I know the King James uses the word charity, and that's probably maybe a little different aspect. And some of you know that there's three words for love in the Greek. Remember what they are? Eros, Leo, and Agape. And they have different aspects. So when a Greek is talking to you, you know exactly what he means. <coughs> when we talk among one another, we don't know exactly what we're saying or what we mean. Eros is a kind of love that's or the selfish love, <coughs> to break in a word erotic. It's a kind of love that gives, expecting something in return. Phileo love. <coughs> we understand that from the city of Philadelphia, the city of what? And that's one thing we should have for each other is brotherly love. <coughs> of course, in, as in some families, there are sibling quarrels and disagreements, and I think other church families, sometimes that even happens here. But we still what? We love each other. Agape. Agape. Agape love. What kind of love is that? That's the kind of love that gives. Expecting nothing in return. And it goes without saying, that's the love that God desires for us to have and that he has for us. And of course, you can break that down in a little bit more definitive understanding. Love God with what? All your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as what? Yourself. yourself. Who do you love the most in this world? Don't we love self? Well, we like to think that we don't, and we put on a face and a facade sometimes when you come to church. You've heard about the story that a mother is upset with her little daughter and yelling at her. The phone rings and she picks it up and she says, oh, hello, Pastor. <laughs> yeah, we can change. Sometimes let's have to finger if we're in certain situations. Out of well, turn to Psalm 130. And we're going to read some verses uh, 1 through 3. We are in a dilemma. <coughs> Psalm 130. Now, I will be reading from the New King James Version. But any translation you have is, is good on this particular text. Because it says, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. 
That's capitalized. That's Jehovah. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive. The voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, who can stand? I like the NIV better. He doesn't use iniquities, he uses sin. You, Lord, should mark the sins. He should mark my sins, and he should mark your sins. Who is able to stand? Oh, why? And, you know, sin is something, you know, we read about is transgression of the law, where there's the King James, where it's all lawlessness. Sin brings pain to someone. Did it bring pain to you? Or did it bring pain to someone else? And probably a pretty good way to describe pain, it's, it's uh, how we receive it or how we get it. It's either imposed or intrinsic. Now what does that mean? What does imposed mean? I'll give you a, a dictionary definition. It's a place, a set, a burden, a fine, or punishment upon another by an authority or someone. What about me? Okay. And interesting means belonging to the real nature of things. It's not dependent upon external circumstances. The story is told about uh, that to kind of define it is that you have a little boy, and as most little boys do, they do things contrary to what daddy says. Does that happen? Mm -hmm. Oh, Mark, I didn't realize your children were perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but you tell them, stop running down the sidewalk. You don't necessarily tell them what, but just stop running down the sidewalk. What are you, the little boy supposed to do? Obey, right? But guess what? He pushes. He doesn't. So he's grabbing by the nap, turn him over your knee, and you let him well, you get to the seat of the pond. And he cries, right? The pain? Is that pain involved? Sure. Oh, okay, let's take that same little boy and he's running up and down the sidewalk. And daddy says, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. You're going to fall and skin your knee and hurt yourself. He does the same thing. He keeps on running. Guess what? He falls, skins his knee. Is that pain? Yeah, but that's interesting. That's interesting. In other words, it happens. You jump off a building, you do what? You go down. Now, someone will push you out. That's right. Imposed. Now, the Bible uses both illustrations. Remember, Adam and Eve in the garden were told, if you eat of the fruit, you will what? Surely die. Now, God didn't kill them. They partook of the fruit. And that's an interesting result. They would die. Does God use imposition? Does he impose upon things? Well, how about the story of Job? Did Job ask for that? Did he do anything to deserve it? No. He allowed the devil to do it. And you find the Old Testament sanctuary service. If you do this, that, but if you don't do that, you get this. Okay. Of course, we know that Satan has certain powers only as God allows him. Now, the wages of sin is what? Death. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't know all the ins and outs, but I know that Vera brought it. I want to find out if she, is she still here. Oh, yes. I'm going to talk to you afterwards and find out from their website because I've been trying to find out from David Asher about this whole process. But anyway, 
it does what? Does things to the mind. Well, where you find the epitome or the height of love is where? On the cross. There is more love shown on the cross than any other place in Scripture. It is, I'll tell you, I just hope I have enough time to get through what I wanted to let you know. Okay, I know some of you things I'm going to have to skip because I know, but just anyway. When Jesus, he, he prophesied, or I should say, he told his disciples what was going to happen. He gave him different things that as, as Jonah was in the well for three days and three nights, so he will be. He told the Pharisees, I will destroy this temple and in three days I'll build it. Bring it back. Now you can look up the scriptures on that, but I'm not going to read all these scriptures. But guess what? Jesus finally took the last walk to Golgotha. Do you know how many hours he was on the cross? Six. How do you know? How do you know it was six hours on the cross? When did the crucifixion take place? Mark tells us at the third hour. What is the third hour? Nine o'clock. And it's amazing that we know a lot about the crucifixion from the third hour to the next half that, which is the next three hours. The sixth hour. A lot of details given. Remember the Pharisees, they wag their heads. He can save others, but he can't save himself. So he would tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. I mean, you can imagine all the things that these were saying to him. He felt physical pain. But as time went on, all these things were taking place. Then one of the thieves, remember, began to take pity on him. And guess what? That was the one glimmer of hope that has brought out that gave him hope. Mm-hmm. Everyone else had left him. His disciples denied him. I mean, can you imagine spending three and a half years with Jesus and then abandoning him? Mm-hmm. Can you imagine? No. Well, guess what? If we'd have been there, we'd have been one of the disciples. You know what would have happened? Yeah, we would have been there too. But the last three hours, what did he told about the last three hours? 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock? Practically nothing. Practically nothing. It says what? About the sixth hour, it became dark. It's dark. What do you do at night? You go home. Go home to second. And this is the time that Satan knew this was his last ditch stand. Mm -hmm. And he had to do everything to do what? To make him come down 
off the cross, even with you. It's not going to do any good. No one can be saved. Save yourself. And you find him to find out that Jesus prophesied that he would raise in three days, but at this point, guess what? He didn't know. You know why? Sin is so heinous in the eyes of God. God hates sin. God hates sin. Listen to this from Desire of Ages. It says, Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. Do you know what that means? It means if you go through with this, you are no longer going to see your father. Forever. That's it. No more. Do you understand what that means? If you begin to think on it, understand. He's going to be totally, eternally lost if he goes through with it. So the Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of his father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that the cup he drank was so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Now, I couldn't find it, but it appears that he had to pay the supreme penalty for every single sin that one has committed. And the reason why I believe that, now I do know that for all of us here, right, that's true. But everyone has an opportunity to want to be saved. And the only way to be saved is through what? The death of Jesus on the cross. So Jesus had a choice to die for the rapist, the child molester, the murderer, every single sin. Now, I don't know if you've read about the Holocaust, the things that were done, not just the furnaces, there were other things too. I mean, it's beyond human comprehension what was done during that time. But you don't have to go very far. You can go in history even in modern times. What would you do? What would Jesus do? He knew that if he died, he'd save you. but he lose out himself. What a choice. What a choice. You know, I don't know about you, but that's a choice I would not like to make. You know, when you sin, we talked a little bit about that in Sabbath school class this morning, what do you feel? You know, there, usually there's two things that come up. You know, right? Either guilt or shame. Right? Have you done of all the things, all the sins committed, are you proud of them? Some of them you wouldn't want anyone to know about. Am I right? Right. Some of you. Maybe some of you, I don't know, had a, a perfect life growing up. Most of us struggle with guilt or shame. And as a result of that, we feel that how can God accept me? I'm so simple. 
I'm so sinful. How can he accept me? How can he take my place and pay the penalty? And then there are things in the scripture. Remember the woman that's caught in adultery. Because we do, we feel like God condemns us for the sins that we commit. But what did he say to her? Where are those I condemn you? Do you want here? No man. He said, neither do I <coughs> go and sin no more. And one thing I, I, I learned, and I believe this, and maybe if you read the book, maybe you will, you'll come to a difficult conclusion, but it's a good thing that anyway, God, when does God forgive you? When you ask for forgiveness? Well, he's already forgiven you. <coughs> he already has. So what's the purpose of confessing? It's for you. loves us whether we sin or not. That's the beginning of a judgment on a godly love. Amen. We'll study that river for how long in heaven? Eternity. Eternity. Now, you can now just hear Satan on the cross when he's on the cross. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. We are all under a death sentence. And the only way it can be saved is by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Only way. Amen. Do you realize I'm about 70, 7 and a half years old. I get that happy. You know, if you're three years old, that's <laughs> but for 77 and a half years what I have made it harder for Jesus on the cross I have am I worthy? no and Jesus says I'm not dying because you're worthy or not worthy I'm dying because I love you I mean, Satan said, Jesus, you can't do both. You can't do both. You can't save them and save yourself. You can do one or the other. Do one or the other. What a choice. I want to read this. Because in the final, those final moments, this, what time did he die? It was the ninth hour. Okay? So three hours of this harassment by Satan. In those final moments, Jesus would choose in the face of eternal loss to save me at any cost to himself. Jesus saying goodbye to life forever to choose to save me when there was no heaven in it for him. He chose to save me, but he chose to save you. Now, as he's suffering on the cross there, Mentally, you give all the sins weigh upon him. It's helped me to be more, more cognizant of my behavior, the words I say, the things I do. Because if I sin, who pays the price even more?
Now, here's something I'd like to have you think of. Think of the person that you like the least. I hate to use the word hate, but it could be. I mean, they was Hitler. They was Stalin. I don't know. Who do, you, who do you like the least? Who is the least person in your thinking? The very least. Let me ask you, would you be willing to give up your place in heaven? So that he or she can be there. That's divine love. That's the love God has for me and for you. Amen. What is love? God is love. The Father. So I wonder where was God at when Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know where he was? The Father. Right there at the cross. Mm -hmm. He was going through as much pain as Jesus was. Mm -hmm. Remember Jesus said, I and my Father are what? Yeah. Are one. Usually I don't use a paraphrase, but Today I'm going to, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 from the Message Translation. It says, I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't have love. I am nothing but the creaking of a rusting gate. I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day. And if I had the faith to say to a mountain, jump, and it jumps. But I don't have love. I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So, no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt. Love never gives up. Love cares more for the others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swell head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, <coughs> doesn't revel when others grow takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always look for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday, praying in tongues will end, understanding will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth, and what we say about God is always incomplete, but when the complete arrives, our incompletes will be canceled. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like an infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. I don't see yet things clearly, but squinting in a fog, peering through a mist, but it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. You'll see it all then. See it as all as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly, just as he knows us. But for now, until that completeness, we have three things to lead us toward the consummation. Trust steadily in God. Hope unswervingly. Love extravagantly. And the best of these three is love. What is love? Uh, 